Awesome. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Andrew will be back leading worship on Sunday and uh, we appreciate him so much. He's just such an incredible worship leader, has such, we just feel God's presence when he, when he sings. And so, so glad to have him. Thank you guys, tech team, Stephen and Michael and Roland for all of you do for bringing this to, to people. We appreciate it so much. I, my message tonight, I want to tell you, I'm going to jump into it because uh, I want to tell you exactly where it came from and why it came from this place. Um, I was recently reading, um, a friend showed me an, uh, an article um, or an Instagram post by uh, Jonathan Martin. If you don't follow him, uh, he, he, he's, he, he'll stretch you a little bit. And so I encourage you to, to follow people like that, make you think. But Jonathan Martin's great. Um, I think he has a podcast or wrote a book called Son of a Preacher Man or something like that, which of course I identify with. And um, Jonathan um, recently put a post up uh, regarding Rachel Held Evans, who is uh, just an amazing writer and activist and just a social justice warrior. And, and she passed away a year ago, and, and he was marking the one-year um, one anniversary of her death with a tribute on Instagram. And um, I just, uh, I was so shocked at some of the things that he wrote and said about her that were just so beautiful, so touching and moving. Um, but one of the things he said, he said, um, he said a couple of things. He said with her that she, she wrote people into his story. Um, those that felt like they weren't a part of the gospel narrative or the gospel story, she wrote them in. And, and then he said this, he said, um, when you were with her, people who were not a people became a people. And it just absolutely wrecked me. For, the, for about three or four days now, I've just been thinking about that over and over again, maybe a week. People who were not a people became a people. And I thought there is probably no better way to describe uh, the, the interaction of Jesus here on the earth with humanity. He was the guy who took people who were not a people and allowed them to become a people. See you, Jim. We love you. Shalom, brother. Um, we, uh, he, 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 that's what Jesus did. And and so I, I decided, you know, let's, let me do a little study tonight. And we're going to maybe spend 20 minutes together, if that, maybe 15, 20 minutes. But I'm going to go through it quickly. But how many people who shouldn't have had a shot uh, had a shot? Uh, recently, my mom and dad were, I think yesterday, spent some, times with Robert's, spent some time with Robert Slearden, who's the, the great church historian. And, um, and he's probably the greatest revival historian alive today. And, and I, I caught a video of him online recently where he was talking about God calling the unlikely. And uh, how many of you know that, that God fishes in a different pond than we do when he's looking for, for someone, looking for a hero here on the earth? He never takes it from the tribe you think he's going to take him from. He never goes to the class of Harvard. I, I know people from Harvard can, can, can be used by God, but he never goes to the places that you think he's going to go. He doesn't reach for the scholars. He doesn't reach for the elite. He doesn't reach for the eloquent. He usually reaches to the unlikely and the, the sometimes some of the lowest points. And, and Roberts listed some of those people who were greatly used by God who were very unlikely. I'll get to them in a moment. But I figured I'd start with the word of God and, and go into the Bible. Let's talk about some of these characters, these characters that that literally thousands and thousands of years later, we're still talking about their courage, their faith, the miracles, how God used them, how they impacted nations, how uh, they, they passed down from generation to generation a legacy. Um, one of them, let's start with Noah. We're going to do, I think, nine of them, nine or ten of them uh, real quick. But Noah, uh, Noah was, was, was used by God, of course, to, to, with, uh, after, the, after the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, the, the world started getting crazy and Noah and his family appeared um, to be the only righteous people on earth, and so Noah builds an ark, and we can go through all of that. But um, even though God knew that Noah was going to get drunk, that he was a drunk, he still chose to use him anyway, and, and he, to save a small a remnant of living things to repopulate the earth. He, he literally used Noah to save, if you will, all of mankind and all of the animal kingdom, every living species, he used Noah. If you could imagine that. He used Noah, a drunk. Abraham was an old man. He was 100 years old when Sarah bore his child Isaac. 
And it was through Isaac's lineage that many of our great heroes came. And of course, which through Jesus came. The Messiah was ultimately born through that lineage. God used an old man, a hundred years old. How many hundred-year-old men do you know have bore, not bore, no, none of them have bore a child. But how many hundred-year-old men have been a part of creating a child um, in a woman's womb? I don't think any of us know any. Very unlikely. Moses was a stutterer. Moses would stutter. And as a matter of fact, when, when, when God came to Moses and said, I want you to lead my people out of Egypt and to speak to Pharaoh, I want you to stand in front of kings and speak to Pharaoh. I want you to literally stand in front of kings. This is what Moses said. Moses responded and said, Lord, I'm not very good with my words. I've never been, and I'm not now. Even though you've spoken to me, I get tongue-tied and my words get tangled. He probably sounded like this. He probably said, I get tongue-tied. And my, 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 my words get, 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 get t -t tangled. Is that the guy? Is that the ambassador you want to send? You get one shot to go talk to Pharaoh to see a whole nation of people who are in bondage and slavery released? Is that the guy you send to negotiate? In the kingdom of heaven, that's who God picks. Moses, a stutterer. Noah, the drunkard. Abraham, the old man. Rahab, the prostitute. I don't have time to tell you the story of, of Rahab, but take me at my word, she was a prostitute. Do you know that if you go into the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, and Matthew actually, in the book of Matthew, it outlines Jesus's lineage. And if you go into that book, you'll see that it actually, when it illustrates the bloodline of Christ, it mentions Rahab in it. Wow. In the lineage of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, we see a prostitute. David was an adulterer and a murderer. He didn't just commit adultery. He, he, he sent the man of the woman he was committing adultery with to the front lines to be murdered. David was an adulterer and murderer, and yet God said he was a man after his own heart. Let that mess with you for a moment. He's unlikely. Jonah was a man who ran from God, and yet entire cities were liberated with a message of who God is because of Jonah. Matthew was a tax collector. Tax collectors were essentially considered the scum of the earth. It was rumored that they would often cheat people out of their money by overcharging on taxes and then pocketing the leftover, rendering back to Caesar what was due to Caesar, but then sticking in their pocket the extra tax. Matthew was a scumbag. Uh, we know of the little boy, a very unlikely person, who God used his five loaves and two fish to feed 5,000 men and probably what ended up being 20,000 plus people. Jesus, of course, was a baby, born in a very unlikely place. Saul was a, 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 a persecutor, a murderer of Christians. As a matter of fact, when he had his experience that we call the Damascus Road experience, on the, he, he had this experience with God. He was on his way to kill Christians. He was a murderer. Anyone who was a Christian, he'd often harm or kill anyone who claimed to be a Christian. And yet we know Saul becomes Paul and writes the majority of the New Testament, what we live out of to this day. The most prolific writer in the Bible. The one that God used to set up what his new covenant would look like and what it would look like being unfolded in the modern church. He uses a murderer, a murderer. Let that sink in, a murderer. We're coming up on Mother's Day and uh, it's, it's got to be one of my favorite celebrations because I just, I can't even tell you how much you know, respect I have for the strength of a woman and the strength of a mom. I, I, it blows my mind um, of what women, especially mamas, are capable of, uh, the pain that they can endure. Guys, let's be honest, we are weak. We might be able to lift a couch easier or a, pick up a 100-pound sack of flour a little easier than some women, but when it comes to pain and, and an ability to, to multitask and an ability to get things accomplished and done and the strength and the, the ideas and the creativity, women are so powerful. And... Uh, 
And um, this Sunday, we're, we're doing something very special for moms. Uh, I'll tell you about it at the end of service. But we, 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 I have incredible, incredible um, respect for moms and for, for our ladies that are, that are a part of this world and, of course, a part of this church. But I, I want to say this to you. The entire gospel was entrusted to a woman when Jesus said to her, go and tell. The resurrection. And during those times, women were, were nobodies. They oftentimes weren't even allowed in the front room of a house unless they were invited by the men. And yet the entire gospel was entrusted to the most unlikely of people, a woman. You see, our, our idea, our society has, has graded humanity. And we see people that we believe are elite. We see people we want to hang out with. We see people we want to connect with. But the reality is this. I want you to hear this. It's not what Jesus did. It wasn't what he was about. As a matter of fact, he didn't rub shoulders with royalty. He made kings angry and he defied the status quo every chance he got. He didn't play to the expectations of holy people. The holy expectations upon him, he looked at and he said, if your expectations get in the way of me treating another human being with the dignity, respect, and love that I came to show to this world, that I came to leave as a gift to this world. You can take those expectations and go home. He ate with reprobates. He healed people that didn't matter to the world. He welcomed harlots. He washed their feet. He didn't, uh, he didn't, he didn't trend his gift amongst the popular. He didn't start an Instagram profile and start tagging all the latest and greatest, greatest up and coming you know, Christian broadcasts. You got to hear this guy speak. No, he was in the hillside with shepherds, hanging out with tax collectors and carpenters and fishermen who smelled like three weeks of being out on a boat. That's who he was with, the unlikely. Some of the people that Roberts was talking about in this video I was looking at is Smith Wigglesworth, who's one of the greatest healing evangelists in, in history. He was uneducated. He could barely talk. He mumbled he actually started his ministry uh, working in a local Salvation Army's uh, children's department where he was using a, a horse and a carriage to bring kids to the Salvation Army. I mean, he, he had horse duty, essentially. Uh, William Booth, another great general of the faith, he got kicked out of the Methodist church because he was too radical. I've been kicked out of a couple of places. Catherine Coleman, I want you to hear this. Catherine Coleman found herself married to the wrong man, and divorced. Catherine Coleman's mantle and anointing for healing did not come until after she was divorced. She finds herself divorced, and the story goes like this. The story goes that she's, she's literally uh, walking, and, and she comes to the end of a cul-de-sac or, or the end of a road in California, and she's sitting there, and she's just talking to God, and she says, God, I have nothing left. I have nothing left. Everything's been taken. My reputation's been ruined. I have nothing left. This is Catherine Coleman. You know, the stadium evangelist. Catherine Coleman, I have nothing left, God. And God says, okay, well, I want to give you a mantle, a healing anointing that I've tried to give to three men and none of them took it. She just got divorced. Found herself with nothing. She had a ministry. It was falling apart. God gives her this healing anointing that literally changes the face of Christianity as we know it today. A.A. A. Allen is one of the greatest tent evangelists. I think he actually had the largest tent by like a foot or something like that. Bigger than Oral Roberts. They would go back and forth. I think it was Oral Roberts. A.A. A. Allen was raised by parents who were moonshiners. The guy was drinking moonshine in his bottle of milk as a kid. His parents stuck moonshine in his bottle. It was rumored that he slept a good 12 hours every night. Parents don't get any ideas. That's a, that you can laugh. It's cool. We're not together. I get it. Thank you guys back there for laughing. Please indulge me. I'm literally staring at these black things that are just like, like transformers looking at me from the mitts that are from, from the mist. But um, he, he was raised by moonshiners and drunk, and yet he went on, came from, from poverty, came from nothing, came from 
just a bunch of backwoods moonshiners and went on to literally have one of the greatest uh, tent healing um, anointings and, and ministries that the world has ever seen. This is what I'm telling you. If we're not fishing in the pond of the unlikely, then we're not fishing next to God. And if we want a church or we want a culture as Christians where everybody's got their crap together, can I say that? Are we good? All right, I got thumbs up. Where, where, where everyone's got their stuff together, if that's what we're looking for, church, I don't want any part of it because it is not the way God ever has done anything. He has always looked to the unlikely. And I'm telling you right now that this church will be a place where people who aren't a people will become a people. We will never be cute. We will never have our act together. We will never not be messy. This will be a messy church. It will be a church with problems. It will be a church with bruised people. It will be a church with dirty people. It'll be a church with where every week you don't know who's going to step through the foot of the door. And guess what? There's going to be some times in this church where you might have to take your kid and go like this. But that's the, that's the price we pay to be fishing in the same pond as Jesus, in the same pond as God Almighty that throughout history has looked to the drunks, come on, somebody needs to hear me, who has looked to those that stutter, who has looked to the adulterers and the murderers and the prostitutes and the harlots and the tax collectors. He's looked to them and he said, you're the ones that I want to transform and change the kingdom. You're the ones I want to mark history forever. They will write about you. It was the dirty, it was the woman who came and, and spent all that she had and, and broke the ointment over the feet of Jesus and wept with her tears and, and, and washed Jesus' feet with her hair. It was her that Jesus said, as long as the gospel is preached and everywhere it is preached, they will mention your name. Your story will be a part of it. And I want to tell you this right now. If you are unlikely, if you are, don't feel like you belong, if you feel like there isn't a people group that you, you, know, you, you know, uh, connect with, you just might be positioned for God to do something incredible with you because it is the unlikely that he calls. It is the unlikely that he uses. And it is the unlikely that 100% absolutely he has changed history with. And if you don't belong to a people group, I'm telling you this church is a place where people who aren't a people can become a people. And the reality is almost every person on the face of the earth feels like they don't quite connect and they don't belong. But in Jesus and in, in, in the kingdom of heaven here on the the earth. There is something that we see over and over and over again, and that is the unlikely are always called. The unlikely are always included. And I, I got to be real with you. I've had some conversations lately that got me so fired up. That's why I'm wound up today. I haven't even had my caffeine today. I'm so wired and wound up because I've had conversations recently and I was talking to somebody um, who just has felt like um, they just uh, don't belong. In, in, in Christianity or haven't felt like that. I don't want to give their age, but they're over 50 years old. And, um, and they said something to me. We were talking, and, and if this is news to you, I'm sorry, but uh, we've received a little bit of criticism around here because of how inclusive we are, because of the fact that uh, when you come here, you might see some people that don't think like you, act like you, look like you, smell like you, drive what you drive, live in the same neighborhood as you. And we've received some criticism for how open and, and loving we are. It sounds silly, but it, we have. And, and even the, the inclusive theology that we, 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 we preach and, and, and a full message of the gospel and what Jesus has done. And we've gotten some criticism. And, and recently, uh, or this past year, we, I, I was telling this, this particular person, I said, uh, you know, some pastors got together and they had literally a meeting to discuss particularly me. And I don't want to give you know, the enemy anything, so I'm not going to get into the story. It's not a poor me thing. It's just a part of life. It really is. It's a part of life. But to discuss me and, and, and this, this, this person who is, who, who is, for the first time in their life, they're over 50 years old, told me the other evening, told me this. He said, for the first time in my life, since coming to Harvest, I feel for the first time in my entire life, I've lived over half of a century, for the first time in my life, I feel like God loves me for the first time. And they said this to me. They said, you know, those other people, the critics, the religious, the elite, the people wearing the perfect clothes, driving the perfect car, having their perfect 401k and everything's lined up, they never cared about me. They've never reached out to me and they never will. 
And he looked me in the face and he said, Dan, stop worrying about it. And I wanna tell you that right now. This will be a place where people who are not a people can become a people. This will be a place, you know, we say, well, you know, where everyone is welcome. Really? Is everyone really welcome? Is everyone really welcome in the churches of our city? Is everyone, everyone really welcome? They might be welcome through the doors, but are they welcome to sit down? Are they welcome to go through an entire service without getting a dirty look from somebody? Or without an usher being assigned to them? Are they really welcome? I know I'm stepping on some toes tonight and I'll finish quick, quickly. But are they really welcome? Because I want to tell you what welcome looks like in the kingdom of God. Welcome looks like you come in, you're a brother, you're a sister. You are somebody that's a part of my family. If, you, if you're a part, you are a part. When you walk in here, our arms are wide open. We don't look you up and down and give you a 10-point assessment. You're not coming in for an oil change. You walk through these doors, we believe wholeheartedly that the, the message over your life is no matter how unlikely you are, no matter how ostracized you are, no matter how messed up you are, no matter how dirty you are, no matter where you come from or what you've come from doing, when you walk in here, you are not just welcome, but the, the, the grace, the mercy, the love of Almighty God is available to you. I'm kicking things back here. I'm so worked up, Michael. I'm tired of it. I gotta be real with you. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of us just, you know, pitter patter Christianity. It just it's so sweet and just, oh my heavens, and just bless you, sister. And then the sister walks by and you're like, did you hear about such and such? I'm tired of the gossip. I'm tired of the nonsense. And if this COVID thing where we haven't had an opportunity to hug one another or shake one another's hands, smile at one another in so long, if this doesn't give us an attitude adjustment of how we need to change the format and the landscape of the culture of our churches, of Christianity, of how we reach the world, of what we project to them, how we represent God, I don't know what will. But I'm telling you right now, there is a shift happening in the kingdom of God. And I feel the spirit of God as I'm saying this. There is a shift happening in the, in, in the kingdom of God right now, in this age and in this hour. There is a shift that's beginning to happen where it is time to get real. It is time to be serious. It is time to be authentic about what we're saying and meaning what we mean or say and saying what we mean and being real with who God is and what he's called us to be and do. This will be a place or people who are not a people can become a people. So bring them in. Bring them in. Invite, invite the messes. Invite the ones strung out. Invite the, 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 the people who don't look like us, act like us. I'm going to say this to you too. Man, I don't care anymore. Invite them to come. Every one of them. Invite the gay, the straight, the black, the white, the Democrats, the Republicans. Heck, you can even invite people that are part of the Green Party. We'll, we'll check with the leadership about that. Bring them. Bring them all in. You come from Mayak or you come from uh, uh, Newtown or you're Lakewood Ranch or you live in Kensington Park across the street. If you drive a Tesla, a Toyota, or a tricycle, we don't care. We want you because we believe that God is building an army. He is building an army of people. People who are not a people are becoming a people here in this place. And I believe it's gonna spread like wildfire across our city and churches all over America where we begin to realize that Jesus came so that we might have life and life more abundantly. Jesus came so that he could wreck and transform the religious system. He, Jesus came so that he could bring life to those that, that nobody cared about. And I will not be quiet anymore. I will not stay silent anymore. It is time for us to stop worrying if we offend somebody out there who thinks that we should be a little cuter and a little more tidy and a little more polished. Forget it. We're putting the polishing rags away. We'll keep things clean. But other than that, come and experience the life-changing glory, grace, and love of an almighty God who came and died a messy death so that your mess that you could come with your mess here and not feel shame and regret and pain and feel like a failure. This is a place where you can come and be restored or you won't be punished, but the promise of God will be your portion. This will be a place where people who are not a people become a people. This will be that place. Sunday is Mother's Day and what we wanna do is we wanna make Mother's Day Dessert is on us. And so what we're going to do uh, Sunday is, for those of you that have not been 
um, paying attention and that's okay. We have changed our service from 10, sorry, from 11 o'clock to 10 o'clock. So we go from 10 to 11, sometimes a couple minutes before, sometimes a couple minutes over at the end. But we start right at 10 o'clock live on Facebook, 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And we end at 11. And at 11.15, we want you to get in your cars when service ends. And actually, we're going to do, we're going to say, we're going to say 11.15. But from 11.15 to 12.15, the first 50 families that come through with mom, we're going to give you an amazing, wonderful gift dessert. Um, really, really, I promise you, it's going to be great. It's one of my favorite things for moms for Mother's Day. And it's not just about that. I know you're like, oh, I live five miles away. Do I want to drive that far for free dessert? Well, for, first of all, yes, obviously, right? But second off, <laughs> second off, um, we want to see you. I miss you guys as your pastor really, really bad. And so it would be a gift for me to be able to see you and your family, even if it's just a couple of you in the car. Bring mom. And the first 50 cars that come through, we will give you dessert Cook for mom. If you can't cook, order takeout, but dessert is on us. And uh, that's what we're going to do this coming Sunday. And this will continue to be a place where people who are not a people become a people. God bless you. We will see you uh, for our Harvest Lives throughout the week, and we'll see you Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. And happy Mother's Week leading up to happy Mother's Day. See you soon.